So in the previous two lectures on health and illness, um, uh, we talked about what it means to think about health as socially constructed. And then um, in the first lecture, and then in the second, we uh, outlined um, what a uh, social determinants of health perspective looks like. So um, what it means to um, uh, 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 think about um, health as not being just behaviorally determined, but um, socially determined. And um, that had two elements to it, how social processes influence us, they impact us, the neighborhoods that we live in, the social networks that we have, stigmatization and stress, um, as well as our race, class, and gender, and other variables influence us, but also how they influence our behavior and thereby also influence our health. So there's the direct impact of social influences, and then there's the social influences on our behavior, which also produce our, our health outcomes. Um, now I want to make this, it's not necessarily more complicated, but to provide another framework. Um, and this is a classic framework within public health of a socio-ecological model. Um, uh, and it was developed by a child psychologist, um, uh, Bronfen Brenner. Uh, and Bronfen Brenner um, uh, basically adopted a bunch of ideas from the um, social sciences and asked, could we just turn them into one model? So the social sciences are interested in individuals, in families, in networks, in neighborhoods, in organizations, and in um, uh, uh, cultural and socio-political contexts, what if we put them all together? So um, this approach, the health in all policies approach, um, is an application of this model, um, uh, but what it seeks to do is to embed people in contextual layers. So to take the individual seriously, but then to take the um, family, context that they're from, seriously, the small um, 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 uh, household context on the kind of micro level, um, to think about the influence of social networks or peer groups on all of us, um, to look at neighborhood level effects, to look at organizational level effects, to look at sociopolitical effects, look at cultural effects. And what this emphasizes is that people make health choices and behave the ways that they do based upon the constraints and resources that are available to them. So families, peer groups, neighborhoods, organizations, all provide a set of constraints and a set of resources um, that influence their behaviors as well as their health outcomes. And it helps us see how health is determined by many different aspects or features of a society. Each layer isn't just its own layer, but it's impacted by or um, influenced by the other layers. So your peer groups don't just exist as peer groups, they're influenced by your family and your neighborhoods. So who are your friends? Well, they're partially influenced by who your family puts pressure on you to say, I don't think that's a good person to be friends with, that's not the kind of person that we're friends with, versus your family being like, you know, um, your parents would say, here are our friends, they have children who are your age, maybe you will become friends too. So families influence peer groups, but so do neighborhoods. You tend to be friends with people who are near you. If you've ever moved, um, one of the things you say to your friends um, is, oh, you know, we're definitely going to stay in touch. We're definitely going to be friends. And you might be, but you're probably not going to be. I hate to ruin that for you. But the, those um, many of the friendships that you have once you leave a place don't endure as much. So each layer of this model is influenced by the other layers. Neighborhood context is influenced by the larger context of the city, the state, even the country. So health in all policies approach is a pop, is, uh, to population health is based on the idea. We need to look at all layers of a um, uh, society in order to improve its overall health. So I want us to kind of dig down a little bit here because as you'll notice in this model, um, uh, uh, we don't explicitly talk about race, class, and gender. Um, uh, and other things that I've said are very important for understanding health. Um, and so, um, you know, you might ask yourself, how would we introduce 
critical concepts like class to this kind of model. And part of the reason that, we do, that you don't see race, class, or gender as a layer of this kind of onion of socioecological model is because those factors work on ev at every single level. So there's um, family dynamics that are racialized. There are peer groups that have racial effects. There are neighborhoods that are racially constituted. We can think of organizations as racialized organizations um, uh, that have racial expectations and rules for behavior. And we can think of the socio-political and cultural context as being influenced by and influencing race. And so race could cut across all of these. The same could be said for class. There are neighborhoods that are important for class, but so too are there a set of family dynamics. You might remember um, back uh, uh, or in another lecture, I talked about Annette Leroux. And Annette Leroux made arguments about how middle class parents and working class parents had different parenting styles. Um, uh, uh, um, one style was natural growth and the other was concerted cultivation. Concerted cultivation was uh, the idea that, that parents are concerted in their efforts of constantly cultivating their children, cultivating skills in their own children. And this is something that middle class parents tend to do because they tend to have college educations themselves and they participate actively in the development of their children and their children's capacities. Working class parents, by contrast, Leroux noted, um, um, uh, engaged in parenting styles that were at natural growth. And what she meant by that was that they were much more likely to trust the institutions around them, like schools and churches and um, other kinds of institutions to help their children develop and grow because they trusted those institutions to provide the critical education and socialization needed for their children. And so there, in LaRose's work, we see how class works at the family level. But we also note that class would work at the neighborhood level. So there are certain critical variables that cut across this model. What this means, though, is that if we want to analyze a social phenomenon, what we should partially do is think about what quantitative researchers would call a multi-level model, models that work for many levels of analysis, or what um, uh, researchers in this context would call a socio-ecological model, um, or to just say maybe there are many different effects um, that are all important. The individual characteristics matter. Um, this includes things like your biology and human capital. Um, it includes things like your basic dispositions, but so too does your family and how your family raised you and influenced you and how you're currently functioning within a family, maybe of your own. So too do your networks or peer groups. So does your neighborhood context. Do you live in a neighborhood with a lot of resources or not? As will your school or workplace or other kinds of organizations, as will the broader sociopolitical and cultural context. And so when we want to analyze why it is that there are health disparities, we might look at every single level. We might look at the individual, family, the network, the neighborhood, the organization, the cultural and the socio-political level as all different important factors that work upon the individual and that work upon one another in order to generate health outcomes. Um, this can be a really helpful way to organize your understanding, to say to yourself, how am I gonna understand this phenomenon? Well, one way to do that is to divide um, uh, um, my analysis into different parts, what's happening on each level of analysis. This obviously yields an enormous amount of complexity. And as scholars, it's really hard to study in a rich sense, each one of these levels. And so I want to remind you of something I said in the methods lectures, um, which is that the social science enterprise is a collective one. It's one where we all generate insights, focusing often on our particular area, but building on the work of people who are working in different areas. So I may be really interested in peer groups and constantly observe 
how peer effects influence people's health. And I don't really focus on individual level um, uh, attributes, and I don't really focus on the impact of organizations. That's fine, because overall, as long as my work is informed by what we know from the organizational level analysis or the individual level analysis, the more holistic picture that we're able to step back from and say, okay, based upon the different work that different people are doing, this is how we think health is being socially determined, that becomes a really effective tool, effective way of understanding. So as an exercise, you might yourself think, how is it that these different layers of this onion or the different levels um, um, of, can be used to analyze my life? Sometimes this is called going from the micro to the macro, the small to the big. You know, here we could think about it, the different layers of your broad ecology. What are your personal, family, peer group, neighborhood, school, and sociopolitical context doing to influence your health? How are they impacting you? And as an exercise, you could take a moment right now, press pause, just say like, okay, let me use this model to try and understand myself and to try and understand why I experience the sets of things that I do, why I experience the outcomes that I'm likely to experience, and to see how you're influenced by these different layers, by these different levels in an analysis. Um, it's a really useful way to organize your thoughts and think about how the individual is, as this sort of germ, absolutely essential to explaining outcomes, but it's embedded within a broad set of relationships that go far beyond just that individual. So this um, uh, uh, socio-ecological model is sometimes thought of as a health in all policies approach, um, where when we think about a health intervention, a uh, health policy that we might enact, we don't just think about one of these levels. We try to think of all of them and how that policy may work across every level of our analysis. Let me finally say here, and then we can move on from this, that um, uh, this isn't just useful for understanding health. It can be useful for understanding lots of different outcomes. Um, so, you know, you can think of happiness as a health outcome, but maybe it's, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But ask yourself, how is your happiness influenced by you and your own dispositions, by your family, by your peer groups, by your neighborhood, by the organizations that you're in, by your political context, by the cultural apparatus around you? How is it that all kinds of experiences are sort of um, impacted by or constructed through these things that are both yourself, but also the much broader context? Another perspective. Um, uh, and it's not a competing perspective, it's just a different way of, of thinking about this, and these things can go together, is to take a life course approach. And this life course approach um, is best typified by um, uh, uh, and explained by the sociologist Glenn Elder, who outlined a theory that health at any given point in the lifespan is related to other points in the lifespan. So um, that your health is going to be influenced by your past and your future. Now, you may think, how can the future in, in impact the present? But our health behaviors at the present moment anticipate our future selves, anticipate where we might be as a future individual. And so we should think about the lifespan development of people and how our agency what we do now is constrained by an anticipation of the future. So um, uh, if you're young, you may engage in lots of negative health behaviors. So maybe you started smoking um, as, a, as a teenager, but you may, and the impact of smoking as a teenager is pretty small. It's not gonna generate a lot of negative health outcomes for you. Um, uh, the reason you don't wanna smoke as a teenager it's because it's hard to quit smoking. And when you're 40 years old, and if you're smoking, it's gonna generate some pretty negative health outcomes for you. And so your future self is constrained. 
I mean, your, your current self is constrained by your anticipation of the future. Is it bad for you to smoke as a teenager? Kind of. But like what it's really bad for is having smoked for a long time. It considerably increases your risk of cancer, emphysema, all kinds of other diseases. And so partially your agency as a teenager is constrained by an anticipation of your future self. So there are specific features of the life course that are relevant to health. There's the idea of lifespan development. Health is a continuous process throughout one's life. The health of adults, for example, represents a progression of health throughout their lives. So your health at this moment is a product of a range of health decisions that you made before this moment, and your health in the future is going to be influenced by the decisions that you make in this moment, as well as those that you made in the past. Constrained agency, as I've just explained, is the idea that people are active participants in how their lives unfold. The choices and actions are constrained by anticipations of their future self and their structural circumstances. So you can't just do anything that you want to produce your health. Here in this moment of uh, COVID that I'm speaking to you from, going to the gym is not really possible. Um, most gyms are closed, for example. So this constrains your overall agency. The situational context influences the likelihood that you can go to the gym. Now that doesn't mean that you can't work out. The gyms are the only place that you can work out, but it is a constraint upon what's possible for us. So we might ask, what are the different situational constraints in the times and places that we live in um, um, that influence our capacity to enact our health? The life course trajectory um, is embedded and shaped by their own lived spatial and temporal history and by the history of the places that they're in. This again is the idea that place has a huge impact on our lives, um, and that the history of those places matters, as does our own personal history. Timing is the, the, reflects the ways in which your life unfolds, depending upon your social experiences and when in your life you had those experiences. So let me be a little bit more specific here. Um, uh, we know that people who, um, have early negative life experiences are more impacted than those who have slightly later negative life experiences. So for example, if um, you have uh, uh, negative experiences in um, uh, as a 14 or 15 year old, they're likely to have more profound effects upon you than if you have negative experiences as a 28 year old. Um, uh, an example of this would be sexual assault. So experiencing sexualized violence has a bigger impact upon you if you experience it in high school as a, as a teenager than later in life. This isn't to say that it doesn't affect you later in life, but the timing of the experience matters. We also know that the age of first use of alcohol and other illicit drugs has an impact. So if you um, uh, first used um, uh, illegal drugs, uh, as a 14-year-old, it has a greater impact upon you than if you first use illegal drugs as a 32-year-old. Again, the idea is that when something happens in your life, it will have a really big impact on your subsequent life. The easiest way to see this is um, early childhood health, that the biggest impacts on people's health are typically the health experiences that they have between the ages of zero and two. It's a huge impact on people's subsequent um, uh, lives. And so if you grow up in a very healthy context between the ages of zero and two, it will have really long-term effects on you. So the timing matters. By contrast, if you live like two incredibly healthy years of your life at the age of 32, 
will be very healthy from 32 to 34. And, you know, uh, subsequently there'll be positive health impacts, but they won't be nearly as large as they would have if you'd had them early childhood, which is why a lot of health interventions focus on early childhood intervention. Um, and so the timing of when you experience particular health episodes matters, whether or not it's at infancy or later in life. And linked lives is um, the idea that our lives are interconnected directly through our social networks and indirectly through our periods in history. And so that you can't just look at an individual. You have to look at an individual and the networks that they're embedded in and their relationship to their past self and their future self. That our lives are intimately linked to past and future and to others. This life course perspective of how we look at people's lifespan, life, lifespan development, how we see how their agency is constrained by context, how time and place influence them, how timing of experiences matter, and how we are linked to our past and future selves, as well as linked through networks to other people, is a way to understand health that focuses on the individual but embeds the individual in a course or trajectory of um, life and a set of structural conditions. Um, uh, I want to take a moment to think and sh and about uh, genomics as well, um, because uh, genes are very important um, uh, uh, to health. Um, and um, uh, I, uh, this is not my area of expertise, I'll be very honest um, uh, about this, uh, but I think it's really important because a social constructionist perspective about how things are socially constructed does not, I repeat, does not negate the influence of genes or genetic and biological influences. It just says that we need to think about those in the context of social influences. If we think about the Bronfen Brenner model that we were presented with just um, you know, a moment ago, we can begin to see how the individual level may include a genetic component. And we know from analysis of genes that the genetic component will be environmentally influenced, that the sets of genes that get activated are in part a response to um, context. This is called gene environment interactions. Social genomics is an emerging field that seeks to integrate social factors with genetics to understand health. And I think this is a really interesting and promising field, um, which helps us see how social conditions may help predict um, uh, uh, which kinds of genetic expressions materialize, as well as how genes influence the kinds of social conditions that people find themselves in. So genes have tendencies, produce tendencies within individuals, and drive them to be experienced um, different contexts, and that contexts influence which genes are likely to be expressed within individuals. And so, you know, this is um, a not very visible, I'm afraid, um, a slide. I thought it would look a little bit better when um, uh, 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 constructed. It looks at the interrelationships between um, uh, uh, genetic and social development. Increasingly, um, uh, sociologists are partnering with experts from other disciplines to create new fields of health studies, and social genomics is one of these. This includes engaging in conversations with biomedicine and with humanities, um, history, for example, um, uh, but also with computer and information sciences. So with um, computer scientists and information scientists, people interested in complexity, to do large-scale social modeling, large-scale modeling, um, to look at both the social, genetic, um, and individual, other individual level factors that may predict health. There is a future, a significant future, in sociology and health in the age of genomics. Sociology here is contributing um, to create this new field of social genomics, which will help clarify the difference between the social concept of race from the genetic concept of geographic ancestry, as one example. So the uh, social concept of race is um, how phenotypes get interpreted 
into categories of race, which are social categories. And there, there will be genetic concepts of geographic ancestry that are related to, but not completely um, uh, uh, determinate of the social concept of race. And both of these are important fields of inquiry. So the genomic concept of geographic ancestry, how people are from particular places and or specific places and how people from those specific places may have genetic tendencies, it's an important field of study. It is not race. Um, and uh, the social concept of race is converting certain aspects of that geographic ancestry tied in particular to skin tone um, to something that we then name race, which may capture elements of the genomic concept of geographic ancestry, but not all of it. So there will be overlap, but not complete overlap. And understanding this is very important because we know that race has effects in the world. And having a better sense of what the genomic elements of the racial effects are, genomic effects not of race, but of geographic ancestry, as well as the social effects of race. So those elements of the race effect that are not a consequence of geographic ancestry or genetic composition, but of something else, will help us better understand the world. This is not a way of saying that race is a genetic concept. It's that there will be certain overlap between genetic um, concepts of geographic ancestry and our social idea of race and identify where the different effects are, what explains what will be essential to our understanding. Further, social um, genomics can help us understand how social forces shape how genes behave. So the existence of a genetic expression is not itself fully determinative of a behavior. People with the same genes behave differently or express um, that uh, 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 genetic material differently. And so why is that? Why is it the case that genes are not absolutely determinate but partially determinative of behavior? Well, a way to understand this, a way to approach this is to try and begin to parse out the social contexts where the behavior of genetic expressions varies based upon that social context. What we mean here is that um, there has tended to be a level of antagonism between sociology and biology, where biologists have been contemptuous of sociologists, sociologists have been contemptuous of biologists, and that coming together to generate understanding is a far better approach. And what um, we're suggesting here, um, what this field is suggesting, is that there are social influences on genetic expression. There are social influences independent of genetic expression. And the genetic expression deeply matters, it can matter independent of those social effects. So instead of saying like, of being hostile to genes, being like there's no genetic basis to race. Well, there's the concept of race is not purely genetically constituted. The concept of race is a social process whereby people interpret certain highly selected uh, elements of a, of a population based on history and phenotype in order to construct race. And so there is no race gene. But there may be overlap between our social concept of race and our genetic understanding and concept of geographic ancestry. And understanding that is better than not understanding it. So we can begin to explore and move beyond this antagonism to integrate our fields that help us see in this study of social genomics how social factors and genetics interact with one another to help co-produce one another. Genetics help produce social contexts. Social contexts help produce different forms of genetic expression and how they each may have effects that are also independent of one another.
The take home here, if this seems unnecessarily complicated, is that understanding is better than not understanding. And that rather than engage in a turf war where we say, from an absurd perspective, genes don't matter, um, uh, or uh, 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 society doesn't matter. Instead, we recognize that both of these things matter, and we will come together to generate richer understanding rather than a competition, a kind of boxing match between these frameworks. Um, finally, history is important to understanding um, uh, 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 health. So there are historical forces and, and contemporary health patterns that matter. Sociologists have contributed significantly to our understanding of historical social forces. So history here can inform sociology where researchers have started to document how historical patterns in society continue to impact contemporary health. The red line that occurred as part of the New Deal policies has been linked to current racial segregation and to health inequities. The future of sociology is an interdisciplinary one. Um, it's an interdisciplinary one, not just in the area of sociology and health, but sociology more generally. Where sociology partners with biomedicine, with the humanities, with historians, um, and with STEM disciplines to better understand how social forces shape patterns in health, as well as illness and experience. What this slide is showing us is, um, how, uh, is, is an example of uh, uh, um, uh, red line. So what this slide is showing us is, are the regions um, in, um, nor uh, this is Atlanta, excuse me, um, where uh, you see these red lines or red areas. And I explained this before in the urban and in the race chapters, but I just want to go over it again um, uh, for a moment because it's, it's important. In um, uh, the New Deal policies, um, uh, part of uh, um, what those progressive policies did was solidify and even amplify racial inequalities in um, uh, the United States. This was central to the Woodrow Wilson administration, um, uh, which was a pretty profoundly um, uh, racist administration. And um, what these policies were, were policies where the federal government agreed to um, uh, ensure loans provided to both homes and businesses in different parts of the city. And what redlining was, was uh, uh, taking maps of the city and drawing spaces in those cities where the federal policy would not apply. So where the federal government would not ensure the loans that were being provided to um, uh, businesses and homeowners uh, um, for banks. And as a consequence, um, it wasn't that people couldn't get loans in these neighborhoods. They could get loans but the loan rates were considerably higher. So if you're a bank and you're gonna give somebody a loan, if the federal government is insuring that loan, the risk of giving the loan is much less. And when the risk of giving the loan is much less, the interest rate can be much less. So you pay less interest. So it's easier for people to get loans. It's easier for people to take out loans. The loans cost them less. What is the consequence of this? Well, if the loans cost less, people will invest more. And they more likely to build wealth. This is the primary, primary source of wealth inequality by race in the United States. Um, uh, uh, and it's a government policy that helped realize this. Um, so this redlining um, uh, is, is essential to racial inequality because when the federal government drew these maps, when these red lines around districts were made, the red lines were drawn primarily around African-American neighborhoods. They were drawn primarily around neighborhoods where African-Americans lived. And the federal government said it's too risky to insure loans to black Americans. Um, and so we're not going to do it. And this created white wealth and black poverty. Um, it's not the sole explanation. There was a lot of uh, black poverty before then, but it helped solidify race. Why spend so much time on this? 
because we can still see the effects of this today on people's health, not just on their health, but on lots of social outcomes. So that when we look at this map, we see it as a race-making map, a way that the US government, the federal government helped make race and make racial inequality. But this policy doesn't exist anymore. Um, it's not the case that the federal government is engaged in this particular kind of um, uh, racism. It may be engaged in other kinds, but this one doesn't exist anymore. But it, the, the historical legacy endures. We can still see the effects on neighborhoods and on individuals of these historical policies. And so the point, again, is to say that when thinking about the future of the sociology of health or the future of sociology in general, we should look to that future as an interdisciplinary one that partners with geneticists, with biomedicine, with people in the historical uh, um, uh, um, and humanistic disciplines, um, and even set, step science, technology, engineering, and medicine to better understand how social forces shape patterns in health and shape patterns of social life um, uh, more generally. And so my hope is that um, what you take away is the deep value of sociology, but also the deep value of intellectual exchange, where um, uh, the, the aim is to have a discipline of sociology that really has important insights, but that those insights seek to build upon and work with the insights of other disciplines in order to create a more complete understanding both of our humanity and of the social conditions that we live within.